Today we're going to talk about the famous two minuets in the Klavier Büchlein for Anna Magdalena Bach. It may come to, as a surprise to some of you that these two minuets were actually not written by Bach. And here I wanted to, to share with you this beautiful cover of the Klavier Büchlein for Anna Magdalena, which Bach very lovingly put together. Uh, you can see this beautiful uh, greenish hue on the cover, as well as this uh, golden trimmings and the date on the Büchlein, which means literally little book in German, is 1725. This book contains various uh, pieces of uh, keyboard music, and by keyboard I mean clavichord, harpsichord, because as you may know, the piano as we know it today did not exist yet. And these pieces were meant for enjoyment and learning for the Bach children. They were written by friends of the Bach family who would uh, sometimes come over and simply write in the guest book uh, a lovely piece or two. And it was Anna Magdalena, Bach's second wife and a mother of 13 of his children, who copied these pieces into the Büchlein. These two minuets in G major and G minor were actually written by a Dresden organist, Christian Petzold. And before we move on to the discussion of the pieces themselves, I would like to tell you just a few words about the minuet, the genre of the minuet. As you probably guessed, a minuet is a dance, and being able to dance was a very important social currency in the 17th and 18th centuries. Without the ability to know the latest steps, you wouldn't be invited to the aristocratic balls, and therefore it was very important to be up to date with the latest choreographies. So aristocrats around Europe would hire French dance masters who would come with their pocket violins and give instruction on how to uh, dance, especially the minuet, which was really the talk of the town and all the rage during that time. This first minuet is a fantastic selection if you are just beginning your journey with the keyboard music of Johann Sebastian Bach, whether you are 7 or 87 years old. Right from the start, we are given a five-finger position in both hands, and that is a G hand position. And you will see that the right hand rolls exactly through that five-finger position very soon after, you're going to have to move to a new position starting on C with your fourth finger on F sharp, which is in the key signature right after the clef. So make sure that your finger is ready in position before you start. And so on. After this octave leap, you are right back in a new G position with a quick pop up to the neighbor note, F sharp. And that takes care of the entire first line. And the good news is that the second line or the second system is um, very much the same in terms of hand position. Let's take a look at the left hand. Here we are in G. Three, very important to count at all times. Three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one. And then here at the very end, in measure eight, you're going to have a leap of an octave, and the hand position is going to get slightly displaced with your thumb on the middle C. And I would just stay in that position if I were you for the next few measures. If we take a look at line two, it fits just perfectly. One, two, three, one, two, three. And now I would recommend switching to the second finger. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three. Now, similarly to the choreography of the minuet as a dance, uh, we should be thinking here in six beats, and that is two measure units. Uh, 
The choreography of the minuet consists of six steps and therefore it is a good idea to think always in two measure increments. And what that means for us keyboard players is that the second measure will be ever so slightly lighter than the first. Just listen. hand most of the time is to support the melody in the right. However, there are moments where you will see more notes, more eighth notes in the left hand part and they often contain what we call imitation. And so the rhythm of those eighth notes from the right hand gets imitated in the left. So every time you see a spot like that do make sure to emphasize that. We will learn much more about uh, the imitative polyphony in the next episodes. So now I'm going to play the first half of the piece and I would love you to tune up your ears to those points of imitation. After that, we're going to talk about the ornaments. The squiggles you will see on the page are trills, mordants, and turns. And we're very lucky to have a document where Bach explains how to play these squiggles, and they are contained in the preface to his two and three part inventions, which we will discuss in the subsequent episodes. Here in measure three, in the right hand part, you see uh, a mordant. It has a line through it. And what that means is that you're going to play the note on which the ornament is written and one note right below it. So that measure will sound. Now the very important thing about ornaments, and I'm going to say it many times because it's that important, is to embellish and to make the melodic line more beautiful. It is never meant for you to feel stressed over or to rush it. So do keep that in mind. It is that extra beauty that we are adding to the melodic line. In measure five, we have one more uh, mordant. And now what you see here, it looks like a grace note, but uh, what it actually is called in the Baroque music is appoggiatura. Appoggiarsi means to lean. So we are leaning on that B and really making it quite a bit longer than what you see here notated on paper. If you feel adventurous enough, eventually you may add a quick trill to it. And I should not say quick because it should not be played quickly. So on, mordant, mordant, and why not another one? I made this last mordant a little bit longer because I have a long note and it allows me time to play a few more notes in there. An incredibly important detail at the end of this first half is to make your fifth finger, your pinky, as light as possible to finish off this first section. So just barely touch the key with your fifth finger. I think you will notice this really lovely symmetry between the phrases. They are each written in increments of two measures and we have a 16 bar first half which will now get repeated. So if you feel adventurous again but probably not recommended as you are just learning the piece but perhaps later on reward yourself with maybe coming up with other ways to ornament the melodic line.
But for now, we're going to move to the second half, where you will find quite a bit more shifts in hand positions. So it already seems as though the second half of the minuet uh, is lesson two in terms of your progression uh, in learning the hand positions. Already changing. In the first four measures, we changed position three times already. Now, this will be very important here as you run up this scale here, that your thumb is very gently put underneath. And so see, this is why we always have to practice scales to make this as seamless as possible so that your thumb doesn't make an unnecessary accent here. We would certainly not want that. Always travel with direction to the next measure. What you will also notice is a new black key, and that is the C sharp. Whenever you see new sharps or flats in the piece that are not contained in the key signature at the beginning of the piece, that means we are about to change keys, and that is to modulate. Usually, that new note will be a leading tone, meaning just right under the new home key. So let's take a look here. We are modulating from G first time we have the new black note. Here he goes again. And in the left hand, resolve into D major for just a quick moment. And I say quick because right after that, the C sharp gets cancelled in the left hand where C natural comes in to bring us right back to the key of G. What you will notice here in the left hand is a new notation, slightly different from what you saw before in the last line. We are being asked to overhold these notes. And it happens to be notated down here. You won't find that level of details in all scores of the 18th century, um, but it does give us a little bit of a clue as to how to perform keyboard music where the sound doesn't sustain the same way it does on a modern piano. So here it provides a little bit of uh, that sweet harmony as opposed to you hear the difference, how dry the second time sounded. So do make a point of overholding. We can add a trill here. You will also notice that I tripletized this figure here in the penultimate measure. I played a triplet. This is something that was done uh, quite often as a part of ornamenting the melodic line. The second half of the minuet will also get repeated, and this is how we will end up with the A-A-B-B structure. This is called binary form, and you will find that in nearly all dance music of the Baroque, as well as the sonatas of Domenico Scarlatti. Before we get into the details of the second minuet, I would like to briefly mention the physical approach to playing the keyboard music of the 18th century. Even though there are multiple treatises talking about the position of the piano and how to play keyboard instruments, I don't think that you need to become a Baroque scholar in order to understand that you should really feel at ease at the instrument. So try to align yourself with the keyboard at about a right angle with your elbow and very easily rest your hands in that five finger position. Your elbows should feel completely free. 
your wrists should be more or less leveled here with your knuckles and your fingers should be resting well within the keyboard so that you have easy access to those black keys that are on the way. The music is very elegant and pleasant and therefore you shouldn't feel any stress in your body as you play it. You should also have easy access to all kinds of articulations from legato, smoothly connected, to staccato or I should maybe say non-legato because it shouldn't be a tremendous amount of effort to play notes detached. Do you see how very easily they are detached as opposed to an active bouncy staccato? So I simply take my hand off the key easily and calmly. This way I will always avoid unnecessary accents and the music will sound at ease as well.